The more I thought about it, I'm not sure how much more we've learned about Anthony Joshua. If people are talking about you, it's a good thing because that means that you know, sure. you're know you doing something right. March the 9th is very, very realistic. The last thing that goes with a fighter is his punch. Yeah. He didn't throw any punches. Forget what gender you are now, it's Welcome to Talk Boxing with Simon Jordan and Spencer Oliver. This is episode 54. And apparently, the rumour mill suggests, not a rumour mill, but a fact that we've been nominated for the best sports podcast in the combat section. Yes. Now, normally, I'd be happy to win these sort of awards. <laughs> but when there's some sort of credit going towards the Scarlet Pimpernel, <laughs> our producer, Pat, it feels like a mixed bag. Right. I mean, do you want to win, Spence? Do we want to win? I think we want to win. We, you know, because we're winners, Simon. We're in it to win it. We're in it to win. And it. we'll the share show the glory. Is, the show with, is what it is. We'll share the glory with the undeserved. Romero, absolutely. Yeah. The Pimpernel, don't know. Pat D'Angelo. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He's desperate. Welcome to Talk Boxing with Spencer Oliver and Carl the Cobra Frotch. Was my introduction today. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the last what, show. That, that's the last yeah. show. Yeah. Lack of Very effort. good. Very good. Anyway, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, mates. You too. Um, feels like it's a, a while ago, but obviously we haven't had a chance to discuss it. The day of reckoning yes. and all that went with it. Um, obviously we saw seven fights with an array of fighters that were recognisable to most fight fans. So we had this embarrassment of riches. Whether these fights were in the right order against the right opponents is irrelevant. They were there on a card. So you've got to give a lot of kudos to Queensbury. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the cash cow that is Saudi and yeah. all that's going with that. But let's talk about that event and let's talk about the people that are in it and it's probably the best part place to start is at the very top mm -hmm. we can work backwards but at the very top which is Anthony Joshua and his performance and what you took from it yeah I thought that um, he delivered a performance that need, was needed I thought that it was, it was good he went out there he stamped his authority early he showed that aggression that stuff that has been missing <clears throat> in his armory for the last you know couple of fights I think, yeah, we, we saw what we needed to see. Did we? And that, I think we did. Did we? I think we did, yeah. Because also Walling is a tricky customer. If you let him get into a rhythm, and Walling was going in there with confidence as well. You know, he sparred Anthony Joshua a lot in the past, but he was going in there with confidence. He was relying on the fact that Anthony Joshua was maybe not as mentally strong as he had been previously. And he was, and that was what he was relying on. I interviewed Anthony Joshua and he said, if that's what he's banking on, he's in serious trouble. And that's basically, that was exactly what happened. Because a mean, lot... A lot yeah. was made of Anthony's attitude leading up to the fight, and I actually felt that his response to questions was about right. You know, someone says you're going to fight Jaron Miller, he says he's a drug cheat, why am I going to fight him? Yeah. Matter of fact. Talks about the style of fight that he needs to fight in and says, correct. I thought there was nothing wrong with Anthony being a little mon monosyllabic. But the question I wanted to ask you and discuss with you is about Anthony's performance against the Wallin that we anticipated mm -hmm. coming into the fight. And was it... Anthony that made Wallin as as average as he looked or was it Wallin? Um, no, I think that no, I think it was I think it was Anthony Joshua I think teaming up with Ben Davison they've, they they you know I think there's been a that's been a, a great um, a great pairing between the two. I think that Ben Davison's a great student of the game and I think he's installed in that added confidence that, that's needed in Anthony Joshua. And I think that we saw that in his performance. He went out there, he looked more relaxed. I saw him doing things that, you know, maybe we haven't been seeing him do. He, he was sort of like, he wasn't so robust. He yeah. was letting the shots go well, putting the combinations. This was the most important thing, Simon. I think even when we saw him um, against Robert Alanis in the earlier rounds and against Jermaine Franklin, you look at Joshua and everything was singles, one jab, one jab, yeah. one, two, looking for the big right hand. What we saw here was Joshua putting his shots together and we saw phase one, phase two, like putting the shots together, going again. And I think that's what's been missing from his performances. And that's the confidence, having, having the belief in his own confidence. I think there's, uh, his own ability, yeah. seems yeah. to have installed that in him. And um, <clears throat> I took, yeah, I took a lot away from Because my initial reaction, because I watched all the fights, um, from the first one, I came out, I went to see Tottenham versus Everton, came out, immediately put zone on and watched it in the back of the car. Yeah. Um, and watched all the fights leading up to Anthony Joshua. And my first reaction was, this was about Anthony Joshua. This was a, a more assertive, more menace, yeah. more in range Anthony Joshua. And, and I felt that there would be criticism, there would be observations about the fact that Wallin wasn't what we thought he was. He wasn't the price on the ticket that we thought he was. But that, but that, but that, my first reaction, as I say, was this was about Anthony Joshua. But the more I thought about it, 
I'm not sure how much more we've learned about Anthony Joshua because the big question that we still have to ask about Anthony is when somebody puts it upon Anthony mm -hmm. and puts him in a space where perhaps PTSD comes into play or, or some sort of flashback to challenges that he's had in the past, we don't know whether Anthony's still got the preparedness yeah. and the propensity to overcome that. Well, I, I think... Is that an unfair observation? Yeah, because I, I, I think that as a fighter, like, w w you know, with Anthony Joshua, I think that we saw, like when he boxed Robert Hellenius, the only time he stepped in with a punch, and that tells you that he's got the confidence because he's committing himself, the only time he'd done that was in that seventh round. And I think he's built on that. And we saw that from the opening bell of this first round. Yes, he wasn't in against a guy that was aggressive, mm. but you still have that confidence in your own ability to step in because to, although Otto Wallin wasn't aggressive, He's a cute counter puncher and he builds up and he's got, you know, a nice rhythm about his work and he builds up the shots. And it doesn't matter how hard those punches are, when they when you get hit, they hurt. You know, and I think that I think that I saw Joshua take that away from Wallin. Um, you know, people may say, well, Otto Wallin's not that fighter, he's not that aggressive fighter mm -hmm. that we need to see with Joshua. Joshua didn't allow him to do that, he didn't allow him to get into any sort of rhythm. So there's a lot of pluses from that performance with Anthony. I think that in the week, the build-up in the week, he was cool, cool, calm, collected about the approach, everything around it. Like that's you can tell when a fighter's in the right headspace. You know when he's left no stone unturned. He's you know he's believing in what he's going to do. And as you said, Simon, you know he talked the talk and he walked the walk. You know he said he he, he delivered on what he said he was going to do. But he didn't seem rattled. He didn't seem uptight. Well, you it was a very good with, approach. But were you surprised of Wallin? I mean, again, again, look. There, there is there's always this feeling, and I think it comes from the <laughs> Joshua camp, that whatever he does is subject to criticism. Yeah. And other people get away with less criticism, less observation. Sure. I'm not sure that's true. It's just how they feel about it. Um, because my first reaction, as I said, was he went in there. I wasn't impressed with Wallin. I was disappointed that he didn't bring more to it, and I thought he was going to put himself in the way of something. Mm. But I think that was Joshua taking that away from him. And, and again, as, as I say, my first impression was that that was what Anthony Joshua did. Yeah. It was more about what Anthony Joshua did than what Otto Wallin did. I still think that there are questions to be asked about whether, when it becomes difficult and troublesome for Anthony Joshua, that whether he's going to have the stomach for it. Mm -hmm. But everything that people expected of that fight, which was a more difficult fight for Anthony Joshua, was made easier by the nature of the way that Anthony approached it, yeah? Yes, 100%. 100%. Why do you think the formula works between him and Ben Davison? I mean, you've had him in with Derek James, right? Yeah. You've had him in with um, Robert Garcia. Yeah. You've had him in with Robert McCracken, and that was, for a period of time was a success successful relationship. Yeah. Lots of observations have been made about trainers trying to get him to be more aggressive. He is a character, Ben Davidson. There is yeah. often a lot about Ben Davidson. Ben Davidson inserts himself mm -hmm. into the conversation and makes himself front and centre. That personality seems to have gelled yeah. quite well. I, I don't get the impression that Ben Davidson is a yes man. No, absolutely not. But I, I also, I also am a strong believer in you know, as a fighter, you go and you may train with ten different trainers, and they could be ten of the world's best trainers, and you will gel with one of them. You'll click with one of them. And I think that's what Anthony Joshua's got. That's what he's been searching for. That's why he's been travelling around, training with the so-called best trainers in the world. But you just get a relationship. It's like a father-son relationship when you, you know, you got, you got, you got to have belief in what your coach is telling you. Ben Davidson is a great student at the game and you know he will have studied Anthony Joshua and that's what he does uh, down sort of in, like a fine with a fine tooth comb mm. and I think what he's done is he's worked on all these little weaknesses and all the little areas that need working on and you could see that in his performance I was really impressed I, I'm, I'm not going to lie when I was there and I was and as the as, as the first bell went I'm just looking I'm thinking wow this kid really looks good. He looks relaxed. There was a nice fl um, fluid movement about his work and more importantly he was believing in himself and I think that's the that is the that's the real strong thing that a boxer trainer need. You've got to have total belief in your trainer. If you do that, that will come out in your performance. That's what you can see with Joshua. And I think that look, credit where credit's due to Ben Davison. I think he's proved himself as a trainer, good trainer in the past. But I think that the transformation from Joshua from this fight to the last one was yeah, yeah it was, it was second to none. Yeah. And the irony of Anthony's position about the feelings that he has and the camp that they have <coughs> that supports him about the 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 unfair criticism he gets is probably an energy that he can fuel he can fuel himself with because let's face it economically he doesn't need to fight yeah right he wants to fight for the opportunity to be the three time, three -time heavyweight, three -time champion, time heavyweight champion and so whatever's fueling him the idea that people have written him off people think that he's gone mm. you know we constantly talk on this show and other shows about other fighters Carl Froch has said it yeah Barry McGuigan said it to me lots of people have yeah. said it to me even Billy Joe Saunders has mm -hmm. said it about 
the fact that they believe the pilot light's gone out yeah. in Anthony Joshua and he's going to have a difficulty starting it again. But he beat Wallin and he beat him convincingly. Yes. And that's all he can do. And I think that, that, that he should take the praise from that and build from it. But he shouldn't want the criticism to stop well, because you, I think it fuels him. I, I'm one with you. And I said that to Joshua in one of the interviews that I'd done with him. I said to him, listen, like you, I knew he was very angry with Talk Sport and the criticism he was getting from Talk Sport, etc. And I had that conversation with him and said, listen, Josh, you should be feeding off that. That's what good mm -hmm. fighters do. You feed off that. Go and prove them wrong. Like, that's where your fuel yeah. should be coming from. Uh, and, you know, I think it, it, to a certain extent, he's sort of done that. He, so I said, look, you're like... If people are talking about you, it's a good thing because that means that you know, sure. you're know you doing something right. That is for yeah. sure. I said, just turn that negative into a positive and that's all you've got to do. Believe in yourself. Don't worry about what people say because that doesn't make any difference when the first bell rings. you just got to go out there and deliver. Um, where do you think he goes next? Obviously, Eddie Hearn has now seen the old gravy train back on its tracks. Yes. And the old cash cow that's there. Yes. Nuzzling up to the Saudi tit alongside yeah. Frank. And obviously, Anthony Joshua back in yeah. situ now headlining the bill, doing a great job. Mm. Where do you think, Anthony, go? I personally think that despite the protestations of how difficult it may be and the complications around the IBF, uh, the relinquishing yeah. of the IBF belt, I think that's where Anthony will go. I think he'll fight Filip Hergovic um, as, the, as Hergovic as a vacant title. Yes. Because Fury fights Usyk, the IBF belt possibly gets scattered. Yeah, but yeah, well, it does and throw it. And, and then you've got a rematch between Fury and Usyk anyway. Yeah. So it makes logical sense for Joshua to be fighting Hergovic. Hergovic has refused to give up his mandatory sure. position to anyone, hasn't he? Yeah, so Hergovic. Again, spoke to him in the week and he said, listen, it wouldn't matter what I've been offered. What it was, it's all about me becoming world champion. I'm that IBF mandatory contender. Once these guys fight February the 17th, that IBF becomes vacant. I fight the number two. Number two is Anthony Joshua. It's a huge fight. That's Josh Joshua's dream to become a three-time world heavyweight champion. The, you know, um, Deontay Wilder has now derailed with that terrible yeah, we'll performance and we'll get into yeah. that. Um, so, you know, that was the fight that was being um, billed for Anthony Joshua in March. That fight now seems he dead and buried I mean, in the water. I mean, Joshua must have looked at that fight with Wilder, which we'll go into a second. I thought, yeah. I wish I had him. Oh, because, mate. Because, there because, was... because everyone would be raving about the performance yeah. if he'd have fought Deontay Wilder. But, so you think, Filip Hergovic, you don't think we're going to get involved in, in Garnu and nope. Gilles Zhang nope. or anyone of that nature? No. You think it will be... All about three-time world heavyweight champion. I think that Filip Hergovic is that fight and that will be next i believe we get that march the 9th then we've got those fights down there you think that joshua can fight because we've got february yeah. 17 we've got the undisputed yes then we've got the issue that eddie says is more complicated than just a straightforward line yeah but let's assume that it possibly isn't the ibf belt gets relinquished by yeah. one of them whoever wins the fight and then you're suggesting that as early as march the 9th definitely you could see anthony joshua Fighting Philip Hergovic, definitely, who had no particular work to do. Well, on listen, that they, fight they, night, they, was it? well, they both didn't, did they? Like Joshua, you know, he, he had a five-round blowout. He retired on his stall um, um, in in that fight. And Mark Demura turned yeah. up for a punch in the face. It, it turned yeah. up, yeah. I mean, he was going down before he even got hit. He, you know, it was like he'd, he'd clearly turned up for the payday there. So night, they haven't got wear and tear on their bodies. You know, while in, you know, as I say, retired on the fifth. So I think, yeah, so, like they'll be back in training now. And that, so March the ninth is very, very realistic. It's a fight that they will both want. It's the fight that we know the Saudis want, and that sets up a big year, twenty twenty four. What about we've, we've we've touched upon it with with Wilder? I mean, I sat there watching Wilder, and I thought this is the flip side of Saudi money. Yeah. This is the other side of the argument, which is you need to have. The only way that event and all the fighters assemble, like Avengers assemble, all the fighters assemble. Yeah. Maybe not in the right order, but they all assembled on the card. And mm -hmm. credit to Frank Warren to get the, the gateway open. Yeah. And credit to the other promoters to get them there. And the Saudis paid everybody what they wanted, so it's not that difficult to do deals in those yeah. lights. But it's the flip side of the argument is, is that Wilder was, there was nothing left of Wilder. I don't want to discredit Joseph Parker, and we'll talk about Parker's performance in a minute. But that was... That was like a Monty Python sketch. It was th that was like the parrot sketch. This is a former parrot. This is a former fighter. Yeah. He had he didn't throw a punch for two rounds. Didn't throw a punch through the most of the fight. Yeah. Was, and didn't seem to want to get involved. He was a shell of his former self. I couldn't quite believe what I was watching. It was as it was unfolding between my eyes. Like after the first round, second round, you think, all right, okay, he's not thrown anything. He's moved, been on the back foot, moving around the perimeter of the ring for the first two rounds. We'll see him going third round, fourth round, fifth round. You think. 
as the fight was unfolding, I'm thinking, wow, this guy actually can't do it now. He can't deliver. You know, a fighter, that's what happens to a fighter. When they get old overnight, which is clearly the case with Deontay Wilder, he's had a long career, like, you know, spanning over nearly 50 fights, been in a lot of, a lot of tough fights. That trilogy or fury has clearly taken its toll but on him. Did you think that leading up to the fight? Because I remember listening to him on the stage and we had this situation where you had the mute Daniel Dubois, the monosyllabic in, in, in Anthony Joshua, yeah. and you had the found god... Yeah. In, um, in Deontay Wilder. Did you it's see insane. that coming? It's absolutely insane. Like, just the, the flip, you know, the, the change in Deontay Wilder's persona. Like, when you saw him, this, this happy-go-lucky, friendly, really appreciating this, where he's at right now in life, etc. And you go, I'm not sure your mindset's right here, mate, because you're talking about, you know, like, 12 months ago, putting people in body bags. Now you're talking about love, peace and harmony. And, mm. and I'm not sure... For you, Deontay Wilder, that's the right approach. And it clearly wasn't. He went out there and the performance was like the, the manner that he was acting in the week or so before where you're going, you're not in fight mode here, mate. Like, you are like, you're on holiday somewhere or you're just, you know what I mean? It was like, be it see was what, very strange. I'd be interested to see what Malik Scott made of it because we had Malik Scott in the studio yes. who I thought was a, a fascinating very artistic individual, guy, very yeah. articulate very yeah. um, able to convey and, and, and express a message, yeah. very relaxed. And, and I talked to him about the lack of technical ability that Deontay Wilder had. And his mm. sole focus was on the fact that that was not necessarily right, but notwithstanding that, the concussive power of his punches. Now, you as a fighter mm. will attribute to this. The last thing that goes with a fighter is his punch. Yeah. He didn't throw any punches. That's what I'm saying. He clearly become gun shy. Now, like I say to you, like, it, like you could see the fight just totally left this guy because you're going, I'm not sure that it was that he didn't want to throw a punch. I just don't think that he had the ability to be able to deliver. Like, he was moving around and you're thinking, let your shots go. And, like, you could see he was sort of like, you know, it was, it was like he was sort of scared to yeah. commit. It was crazy watching it unfold because, like, Joseph Parker, who, who, who put in a brilliant performance because he had to have the confidence and his belief to stand in front of there in front of the one of his biggest punches of modern mm. times. And he had to meet fire with fire and he had to go out there and take that away from him. And that's exactly what he'd done. You know, he went well, out I there and he held the ring well. That. He did that when he, once he realised that Deontay Wilder wasn't going to throw anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know. I mean, and Wilder then, coming at 15 stone free. But isn't, I mean, that, what? But isn't that... He's normally about that level, though, No, he? It was just, he just looked really skinny and just everything yeah. about him. You just go... I know he's been up in the mountains in this retreat mm. and doing whatever he's been doing and sort of like, you know, yeah, I just, I just think it was, uh, it's been a really bad move for him. I just think that he's not in the right headspace. I don't think the fight's left in him. 38 years of age and, uh, yeah, I think the best days of Deontay Wilder are well and truly gone. It's a shame, you know, we never got that fight with Anthony Joshua and that's, that's a classic example of leaving it too long, waiting too, you know, too long for the big money. That was a fight that could have happened and should have happened maybe three years ago and, we, mm. and now I don't think we'll ever get it. You think, I mean, I do. I think, I mean, I, I watch Wilder in almost disbelief. I felt, we felt, we discussed it, that we felt Joseph Parker had a chance. Yeah. And that there was a lot more of a chance that Parker had than people initially were going to give him yeah. credit for. And as the weeks went on, we spoke about it on a number of occasions. Lots of other people spoke about mm. it as well. And, and the more people began to speak about Joseph Parker, because obviously we, we think of Joseph Parker in his recent incarnations where he's got knocked out by Joe Joyce. Yeah. And he struggled in other fights. Mm. But this is a different Joseph Parker now. Because the, the, the observation of Joseph Parker for me was he talked a great fight yeah. when he went against, um, against um, Anthony Joshua in 2018. Okay, the referee didn't help that fight, yeah. right? But the point is, is that he didn't let his hands go. Yeah. And he hasn't let his hands go in other fights. And everyone's talked about the ability that Joseph Parker's had. Yeah. And he went in and he let his hands go against Joe Joyce, didn't make a dent. Yeah. Right? But in this instance, is this a, is this a, a new revitalised Joseph Parker or was it just a dog <laughs> Deontay Wilder well, and everything looks better as a result of that? I think it, it, it's a bit of both, if I'm totally honest. But it's funny because speaking to Parker... Um, off the record with the fight against Joe Joyce. And he said, listen, it, like, it's the worst thing a fighter can do. That's why I've not come out and said it or whatever he said. But I was in the build-up to that fight. I had an illness that did seem to sap my strength. I was going in there still thinking that I had enough to beat Joe Joyce. But I'm not using that as an excuse. Just letting you know that I was not 100% going into that fight. And I think as we, from that fight, what's he had now? Four fights since then? Something like that. And he's sort of, like, yeah, three fights this year. And we've seen him building and believing in himself a little bit. Andy Lee's a great trainer as well, by the mm. way. And I think the added confidence that he's getting from Tyson Fury as well and working with Fury. I just think that they showed in his performance. I think he's established, established himself, you know, in the top four heavyweights in the world, if I'm to totally honest. I think, like, on that performance, 
he looked athletic, he looked strong, he was committing himself, mm. you know, and I just think on that performance, you look at that and you go, wow, you've you, you put yourself well and truly in the mix here. It's, um, Where's yeah, he go next? It's an interesting one. Where does he go next? Because obviously he's chasing that fight with Anthony Joshua. They both box on the card. You know, that's a, that's a fight that he would like. You know, he wants it. Where does Joseph Parker go next? Like 31 years of age. Can you believe that? Mm. I mean, like, that, like he seems to have been around mm. forever. Mm. And I think he is just coming into his prime. Yeah. So next 12 months or so are going to be interesting for him. Where does he go next? Do you know what? A fight with someone like Daniel Dubois I'd like to see. Because obviously these heavyweight, the heavyweights and the heavyweight belts are tied up at the moment. So you're looking where he'd go with that. Daniel Dubois and him would be a great performance. Dubois had a great performance against Miller as well, to be fair. Yeah. You know, I think, all right, forget that Miller was 333 pounds, looked totally overweight and he was coming forward. But you just looked at it and you just go like, Daniel answered the questions that needed to Did be he? answered. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. I mean, I mean, Miller, I've got to say, Simon, sitting at ringside, when, when he did let his hands go, yeah. which was quite rarely, but when he did, the power in the shots, you're just going, wow. And he, and he hit Daniel with a couple of them. And I'm thinking, after the second round, I'm looking at Daniel going back to the corner and he comes out and he's still breathing. And I'm going, he's starting to gas a little bit here because of the... He were, like Miller was making him work so much and I'm going, he's starting to gas a little bit here. So now we're going to find out if he can. When we get into those later rounds, the pen, pen, penultimate rounds, 9, 10, 11, 12... Will he still be able to go there? You know, will he prove the doubt was wrong? And I think he did. I think he really, I really, I See, truly I believe he did. Did you, go, did you go into this fight? I didn't go into this fight thinking Daniel Dubois was at jeopardy of losing to Gerald Miller. Because, I actually did. I mean, Gerald Miller is a product of, <laughs> ultimately, the question would be asked of him, does he actually beat anybody when he's not been juiced? Yeah. If you look at his record, it's not that great. Yeah. And Daniel Dubois has been in with world-ranked heavyweights and put in decent performances. The big question for Daniel was about swallowing it, wasn't it? That was, the, his... that, that was the, I think that was the only question for Daniel. I don't, I don't think anyone was doubting his punch power, you know, his, his um, capabilities on, you know, committing himself when, you know, when, when he needs to, etc. All the, you know, he ticks all the boxes. The, the, the only question mark hanging over Daniel was, you know, the heart, mm. as it, you know, as he got the heart, can he bite down on his gum shield? I think that was the only question. I think that he actually proved that he could there. And I think that Miller, you know, Miller tried to put it on him a couple of times, but he sort of weathered the storm a little bit. And like I say, after the second round, I'm looking at Daniel and going, he's breathing heavy here already. Yeah. So now that, that heart is going to come into play right now. And I think he'd done that. He delivered. I saw Don Charles done a great job in the corner as well. He was really pumping him up. His dad was screaming down at ringside as well. But there was times there when Daniel, as a fighter, when you're sitting there, when you get to round seven and you look up and you see round seven and you think, oh my God, you know what I mean? I've got, I'm have got i only halfway through the fight here. Well, it's a 10 this round is tough. Way. Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, you look up and you see that and you think, all right, you've got rounds to go. You think, honestly, that's when a fighter starts feeling sorry for himself. That's when a corner man really has to play, and play his part in picking you up, you know, motivating you, getting you out there. Don Charles done a great job with that with Daniel because you see the head drop a little bit. I'm going, I know he's feeling the pace here, like, you know, like as early as round two, three. Don Charles and the team done a great I, but I think, job of picking him up. I think there was up. also a bit of nerves. I think going into that fight, I think he knew that there was a lot on the line for him. Yeah. And I think once he started to realise that Gerald Miller might not be as big a problem as he thought he was going to be, yeah. that I think he grew into the fight, Daniel. Yeah. And I was pleased, I'm pleased, I'm pleased he got the stoppage mm. because on paper, that stoppage looks very good. Yeah. And the way he finished it and he went, the way he got him out of there was good. I mean, yeah. what, 10, 15 seconds to go of the fight. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's a stoppage, isn't it? On, yeah. on, on your record, it's a stoppage. I suppose now the question is, is what do you do with Daniel next? You I took, mean, don't you, you think, think Parker you... would be a good fight, Simon? I well, mean, stylistically, that would be a great fight. But, but you've, got, you've got Frank last time round suggesting that he should be reinstated as the mandatory on the WBA because yeah. of the circumstances that happened with the Usyk fight. Mm -hmm. He got an opportunity to fight Usyk and, and they took it and it was probably a shot to nothing. If he lost, yeah. it was not, no discredit. If yeah. he won, it was an op a huge opportunity taken. And he's now had the Gerald Miller fight. We've seen him go against Joe Joyce, and I think most of us at the time picked him to win that fight against Joyce. Yeah. And there absolutely. were certain limitations that got found out in that fight. Yeah. He didn't look comfortable getting into the ring in the first place, mm -hmm. and he didn't look like he had many ideas once Joe Joyce was able to take his punches. Sure. And then he broke down, and the first set of questions started to get asked about mm -hmm. his heart. But which direction would you have him in? You've got Zhili Zhang coming out with the fact that he doesn't think he should be stepping, i.e. he ain't ready to step in, yeah. in the ring with me. Yeah. And we've seen that that was an unwise move for Joe Joyce to take that fight. Mm -hmm. And yet he did. And yeah. then he took the rematch and we all thought the rematch was unwise. Now it's put Joe Joyce yeah. a little bit in the wilderness. Yeah. 
Daniel Dubois has got himself back into the conversation. Where do, do you, where do you think he should be going to get an outcome? Because people keep saying that if, if we can answer the questions about whether the kid's got the heart for it, and, and some would say those questions have been asked yeah. and answered now, yeah. that he's going to be a world champion. Yeah. But isn't it about matchmaking now and getting him in the right fights at Definitely. the right times? Well, of course it is. 26 years of age. I think, again, this is where the training comes into play and finding the right training for yourself. Don Charles has done a great job of him. I was speaking to Don through the week as well, you know, about the psychological stuff that he's been going, working with with Daniel. He said, look, you know, as you know, he's got all the attributes. He's got that, you know, he's, he's got everything in the locker, you know, to become a world champion. He's, you know, physically very big. He punches very hard. He's quite athletic. He said, but here was the big problem mm. with Daniel, not believing himself. You know, when things got tough, you know, he didn't know what to do. He'd panic in his, you know, in his own mind and hence why he'd go down or whatever. He didn't know how to deal with that situation. Don's been working on that side of him. He said he's been working as much mentally as he has physically. And I think, again, that's that, that teaming up there. So where's he go? Yeah, so he go. I, I, that's what I said to you. I think that, You think Joseph Parker? I think that's where I think he goes. Um, yeah, if you look what at the landscape. What does that give him? Where does that open? Where does that take him, though? That, it takes him the same place as boxing Zeli Zhang. Only I wouldn't want Zeli Zhang, who's a big southpaw. He's got quick hands, you know, and, and he's a more difficult fight, I believe, for, for Daniel than... Of Joseph Parker because stylistically so and I just think that stylistically what does it do for Daniel it just ticks another box as in beating another top class contender and I think that's where Daniel is right now you don't want to stick him in what's it do he's for not Joe going to get world what's it do for Joe Parker though Joe Parker's just just eclipsed what people consider to be the real danger in the division yeah where did why does Joe Parker go like this but, but, yeah, well, he, he, he's sort of yeah because the, because Daniel's world ranks as well yeah. and I think for these guys now while these titles are tied up and, you know, with the position of, you know, like the IBF and, the, and WBA, etc., I think for people like Daniel and for Joseph, you've got to fight the next best contender. And I just think that, again, it's all about the money, the Saudi money, etc. And I just think stylistically, it's a great heavyweight fight. We don't necessarily need the titles on the line right now to get to, to make these big heavyweight fights. I mean, look, if we look at that bill there when you, um, when you have... You look at all the heavyweight fights that were on there and you look at Hergovic and, and, Frank uh, Sanchez. Yeah, and, and Frankie Sanchez against Junior Farr, etc. You just look at it and you go, they, there's great names on there, but not very competitive fights. Mm. You know, you looked at it and you just go, right, bang, this is what we're going to get. But I think it's like a Super League where you're going to get all those great names now mixing it with each other. And I think that's where we're at, Simon. I think that was what that show was all about, a showcase of, right, this is what we can deliver. Now you're going to see these guys we'll fighting see. each other. We'll see. And I, that's, where I, that's where I think we'll it's see. at. We'll see. I mean, I, listen, I mean, it's very easy to criticise. And, and one of the things I was going to mention to you before I get onto a couple of other fights and round off the show was the atmosphere. Because I've had this little disagreement with Frank Warren. And I know that you can't disagree with anybody in boxing because if you criticise them, they get all <laughs> upset. And we all know that the Saudis are the game in town economically. So yeah. nobody wants that milk curdled. Yeah. But I did feel watching it that it lacked atmosphere. Now, Frank says, not inside, you weren't there, Simon. You weren't inside the auditorium, yeah. so you can't tell. But I've not, been, I've been not been inside lots of auditoriums and watched them through DAZN or Sky or TNT and felt that there was a real tingling atmosphere. Yeah. I didn't feel that. Yeah. Um, and Frank said, well, you're not going to to some extent because you only, seem to, you only feel that when you've got a local fighter in that sort of environment. Yeah. What was it like? No, I, I think that was that was the nature of the fights. So that you didn't get the atmosphere that you that we would get maybe over here. Or I think we've been spoiled as British fight fans over here because the uh, I'm sorry, as, as, uh, yeah, as British fight fans, uh, as in the atmosphere that we get there, you know, is absolutely second to none because the, you know the fight fans actually love their boxing here. We yeah. didn't get that over there because he's not got the travelling fans. I think that's an issue that they need to sort out. Yeah, I mean, look, as a spectacle, it was incredible. The, the event maybe lacks atmosphere because we haven't got those travelling fans. But it will build. A lot of local, but it will of build. Of course it will. Because in order, in order for them to do what, they, what everyone thinks they're going to do, right? And at this moment in time, yeah. it's all about the Saudis because they're the money. So everyone's running to it. Yeah. It's the honeypot. So Frank's there, Eddie Hearn's there, Kala Sauland will be there, or his yeah. brother will be there. And everyone's there and everyone's excited how wonderful it is. But these guys are providing the money so that yeah. no one can jeopardise that so no one can say anything critical. But I do think it's fair to suggest that if, the, if they're going to become the fight mecca, then they do have to provide for the, the environments that Las Vegas and Madison Square Garden 
and London have created over the years to give mm -hmm. it the fully rounded package. Yep. Because whether, whether Frank or anyone likes that observation, it did feel to me like it lacked a bit. The fight card was remarkable. But so I suspect we need to give them a little bit of time. I'm not in the camp that thinking, I'm sorry, I don't yeah. care who likes it or not, that everything the Saudis are doing are wonderful. Yeah. I'm not. I think that, I think that the Deontay Wilder that turned up was a Wilder that turned up for money. They all go there for money, mm -hmm. price fighting. But if there's so much money available and yeah. you don't really need to be worrying about anything else than your next career mm -hmm. move because you're getting paid so much money, I think it takes away some of the motivation. But we'll see. I want to get on to, I want to, get on to Bivol versus Lyndon Arthur because I found myself wanting to kick the television screen in watching that because all Lyndon seemed to want to do was have on his resume that he survived 12 rounds with um, Dimitri of, Bivol. Yeah, uh, yeah. You it's an opportunity. Of, you, yeah, listen. It's uh, an opportunity. You've, you've hit the nail on the head. It's all about opportunity. You know, when we get on to Ellis Zorro and, and Jai Easy Opatai say, before we say that. Say, I'm not in against the beast. No. But Lloyd Hannigan was in against the beast against Donald Curry. And he did what he had to do to do you know, win the fight. Do you know what it was, Simon? I don't think it was that he didn't go out there and he wanted to give it a go. I think he went out there and just found the levels. Too and much, I think yeah. that's what it was. Dimitri Bivol went out there and from the first... But like the sound of the shots, we were sitting obviously at ringside, and the sound of the shot fuck, landing fuck, was, fuck, a, fuck. Uh, was a different sound. You know, and people talk a lot about Dimitri Bivol's power, etc. Listen, when he opened up, mate, trust me, and he was letting those body shots yeah. go and putting them together, the sound was like, yeah, it, it was different. And you just looked at it. I looked at it as early as... The second or third round, I went, this is levels, right? And it was not that he didn't want to give it a go. But did he suffer it, from, the, from the Craig Richards thing? No. This is the Craig Richards. Don't forget, we talked about Bivol. We've no. all gone raving about Bivol in the last 18 months. Yeah. Before that, we were going, well, Craig Richards made him, yeah, Craig Richards yeah, yeah, believed yeah. in himself. Was yeah. there a little bit of that with Lyndon Arthur? No, I just think it was, again, it's just levels. Le Lyndon went in there and like, you know, when you're fighting a fighter and you, and, and you, He's, he's two moves ahead of you every single time. There's nothing you can do about it. It was not like Lyndon hurt him with a good body shot yep. and he went on there and he tried to build on it, but he couldn't because Dimitri Bivol quickly turned it around again. Bivol was controlling the space. Everything he was doing, he was like two or three moves ahead the whole time. He was setting traps and he'd done everything. And I think it just become a case of Lyndon Arthur staying in there and surviving mm. because there was times there where you go, he could come out now. You know, he's done well, he's hung in there, he's, you know, he's against one of the modern day greats in my eyes. Uh, and, and yeah, he, but he hung in there and he'd done what he had to do and he hurt him and I think he'll take a lot from that. But it is all about levels and, yeah. and Bibble proved that he's a pound for pound top fiver. I mean, there's, there's a raft of other fights on there, but I'm only going to cover one more fight. I don't want to talk about Philip Hergovic's dem demolition of Mark Demora. No. And I'm not particularly interested in going down to Frank Sanchez versus yeah. Junior Farm, but... Jai Apatea, obviously we spoke to him a few times, he's a very confident lad, mm. uh, believes in himself. Um, obviously there was resentment going into that fight that he was forced, in his mind, to vacate the IBF Cruiserweight title because yeah. of the nature of the fact that he wasn't making the defences that he needed to make. I thought it was a mismatch against Ellis Zorro. Yeah. And there was a miles gap in class, wasn't there, in quality? Again, it was about opportunity, Simon. Mm. I think for Ellis Zorro, you know, speaking to him and his team, I saw him at the airport afterwards, actually. Lovely guy, Ellis Zorro, by the way. But he just said, listen, mate, he said, you get given, like, we, this is called prize fighting, you know, and mm -hmm. this is what we do. The dream is to fight for the world, yeah. you know, for the world title, or to fight one money. of the be world's best. In Jai Apatia, I see him as the best cruiserweight <laughs> in the world. Yeah, we'll talk about the IBF and relinquishing that in, in, in a second. But he was saying, yeah, like Ellis was saying, look, it's about opportunity. And I went in there and he set the trap. He hit me with a left hand. Hit me flush on the chin, and that was it. Mm. But guess what he got from that? He said it pays my house off. It gives me my, yep. my family its future. Yep. Why would I not take that? What does it benefit Jai Pataya? I mean, what does it give him? I mean, he's in the same position. It gives him an economic return, doesn't it? Yeah, well, that, that's all it gives him an ep economic return because he loses his IBF belt yep. in in the process of doing that. But Jai, I spoke to Jai. What a guy out there as well. What a lovely guy. I spent a bit of time Is with he? him out there. Really nice guy. And he was saying the same thing. He said, look, we're all in it for the same thing. Yeah. This is a sport where people get injured, people die. Like, we get in there, we want to, you know, we want to earn good money and get out. He said, like, what do I do, Spence? I've got the IBF world title. I had that voluntary, uh, voluntary um, defence against Jordan Thompson. Mm. He said, so I was not allowed another voluntary before the Marius Bradus one. But the Marius Bradus fight is going to happen in March or April. That's sort of signed. Mm. He said, but they wouldn't let me do this. He said, but this opportunity was presented to me. He said, so what do I do? Take a potload of money or keep my IBF belt. Mm. And he said, and that's basically where I was at with it mm. and not fight. So he said it was a no-brainer. I will go is back. He the, is he the, I mean, ultimately, we've seen him in two fights with the opposition, with all due respect to both classes of opposition. Yeah. Jordan Thompson is a big, huge cruiserweight, yeah. but he hadn't fought at that level. Yeah. And you saw the levels. Yeah. And clearly with Elisoro, you saw the level. I mean, Jay Opato hadn't even got warmed up. 
really. Wow. Yeah, he was uh, and, and he just blew him off. Yeah. Or blew him out of the ring. Um, do you think that's helped Jai in terms of having two fights that are not really doing anything for him? And do you think he's the best cruiserweight out there? And do you think our boys have got any chance of giving him any trouble? You know, you've got Chris and you've got Richard Reactpo and you've got Lawrence Akoli. Mm. And maybe one day Ben Whitaker. I'm going to give you a little insight into... Um, so Jai told me that he'd done a three-fight deal out there. Um, and he said... Oh, no, he'd done a two-fight deal out there. But then um, Turkey Al Sheikh um, mm. had called him for dinner. They went for dinner out there. And he said, right, listen, I want to now turn this into a three-fight deal because the third fight, we want you to fight Jai Al Pattaya in possibly a catch weight because we see that as a huge fight. Who did he say that to? To Jai Al Pattaya. Jai oh, sorry. To, yeah, we, sorry, we want you to fight the Dimitri Bivol. Sorry, sorry. yeah, yeah, he can't fight himself. Only people like you do that, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, Dimitri Bivol. He said, no, right. in, a, in a catch weight, in a catch weight. So okay. he said, that's where... He said, that's where we're at with it. He said, so, you know, that's where... He's got a free fight deal. Just had that one. So who's coming He'll down? He'll fight again. So who's coming down and who's going up? He'll have to come down a little bit. And, right. uh, and Dimitri Bill is light heavyweight and, and cruiserweight. The they'll so they'll do a catch weight yeah. there. Because he couldn't move up to cruiserweight and fight for the cruiserweight title because he'd be too small. Um, you know, um, mm. Jai Apatai is a very big guy. But they'll probably do a catch weight fight. And I think... I think what it's about is the best fighting the best, and this is what mm. we want to see. Yeah, well, right, it's, we'll great, see what uh, it's great having those, you know, mm. but I, I, we saw it with Ryan Garcia, didn't yeah. we, and Tank Davis, where you go, it's great having the titles on the line, but that's sort of like with the politics of the sport, that or sort Terence of gets Crawford in the way of... Yeah, exactly. Mm. I mean, we, we need to see these fights, and I think yeah. that, yeah, Joyce says, look, that's where we're at. Well, he we'll said, would, who wouldn't want to see that? We'll see. What a look, great fight. Um, Saudi will be what it will be. We'll see if it becomes the Mecca and we'll see. Do you, just quickly, do you think that the, with the um, investment from Saudi Arabia and then getting involved in the sport, do you think it's a good thing for the sport or not a good thing for the sport? Because I think one thing it has done is I take away the, the politics. I have mixed emotions towards it. I think if it takes away some of the nonsense where promoters can't work together, it's a good thing. If it creates an artificial financial landscape that can't be matched anywhere else in the world, then I think it's a problematic. Mm -hmm. um, I think if um, I'm not one of those that runs towards the honey, that's yeah. going to become someone's boy because you can be called over to Saudi and be given some money to go and, yeah. and do things there. I find that, uh, you know, a little bit, not so much disconcerting. It doesn't sit with my psyche very well. But I also understand that if these guys want to build a boxing landscape and they've got the money to do it, and the problem has been that the, the financials, finances have been a problem to yeah. make these fights, then who should stop them from doing it? Yeah. And if it can develop into uh, a proper landscape for boxing that benefits everybody in boxing, and like you say, mm. they're prize fighters, they're there putting their lives at risk mm -hmm. um, and uh, generating opportunities for their families. If the Saudis are, bit, are going to be the ones that give it to them, then it's up to everybody else to either find yeah. a way to match the Saudis' opportunity or, or accept that they are the boxing mecca and hope that they do things in the right way. Now, talking about Jeopardy and talking about um, the challenges of boxing, I was pretty surprised um, to see that in America um, they have changed their view on transgender boxing, suggesting that biological males uh, or boxers that were born as biological males that have transitioned yeah. um, to what they can loosely describe as female, yep. um, can now fight um, in women's boxing. Yep. Now, you've spoken previously. You're ideal to talk about this because you were injured in a ring. Yep. But you've also spoken, when we've spoken to Natasha Jonas, about three-minute rounds and the evolution of women's mm -hmm. boxing, about the fragility yep. of women's skulls in comparison yeah. Yeah. To, the, to, the, to the composition of a man's skull. Mm -hmm. How in Christ's name... Can, I mean, I thought this had all been knocked on the head. Yeah. I thought that the idea, I thought the American Swimming Association feeler had suggested Absolutely. that they weren't going to allow people of a, that, are, that, are, that are biological males mm. that have transitioned to compete yeah. in women's sports. I know there's qualifications. I know there's a four-year period that they have to be below a certain well, level, of, level, et cetera, certain et level of testosterone. But this is, got, not, this is not the right this, direction, is it? This is, this is so simple for me. I can sum it up in one word. Done. I don't need to say no more on it. I think it's a disgrace. It feels like it. A disgrace. It? Like, I, I think whoever's making those decisions needs to be sacked straight yeah. away. I mean, look, look at, at, at what cost? Are we talking about a life here? I mean, yeah, where are we at point. with it? And that's where we're at, Simon. Forget about yeah. the hormone levels being at a certain place. You were born a male. Yeah. You are competing against a female. Forget what gender you are now. I think it's anatomically proven that bone density 
of biological males yeah. is bigger than that of and stronger than that of biological females. Absolutely. Yes, you can manage testosterone. I know testosterone is predominantly for muscle development, mm. isn't it? Yeah. But notwithstanding that, you're hitting somebody in the face. Of course. And your face doesn't have muscles, it has structure. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the jeopardy. Absolutely. And I don't know what these people are engineering here, but I suspect when somebody gets badly hurt, if this ever manifests itself that's in what a I'm saying, at what situation, cost? It's insane. It, 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 it feels of all the sports, if any sport categorically shouldn't be taking this position, it should be boxing. And I'm Absolutely. gobsmacked that the Americans feel that this, yeah. even under the qualification of a certain amount of period of time, having gone from the transition and certain levels of testosterone, that this looks like a good idea to somebody. That's absolutely insane. Like, I, I, I'm still struggling to get my head around it. When I, when I saw I thought it was a joke, if I'm totally honest. I thought it's like it's, it's someone was playing around, someone's falsely mm. wrote something. But, you know, the, it stands as it stupid stands. Times. I mean, it is yeah, stupid it's an times. absolute disgrace. We're in, you know, we're in well, a... Well, let's, let's hope, hope, and I would expect that nothing like this manifests itself over here. Sure. I'm pretty sure the British Boxing Board of Control will have none of that mm. because it is ridiculous. There's no argument. There are two sexes and, 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 and there is no necessity yeah. for biological males to be competing Agree. in female sport, full stop, let alone combat sport. End of conversation. Anyway, right, that's it for episode 54 of a potential award-winning show. We need you to Why, vote for us. I was going to say, how do they do that? How do they do that? How do they vote for us? How do they vote for us? How do they vote for us, Pimpernel? In the description. In, in the, the description, description below. And vote for the show in the Sports Podcast of the Year Awards. But that doesn't tell you how you do it. Do you go to a website? In... The subscription down below. In the description down below on this show. <laughs> See you next time we're out.